Hello, everybody. Let me just erase some word. I don't have this. Does this look real? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Looks like I'm just erasing the, the thing. That's kind of fun. <laughs> anyway, erase the board. I'll change my background. I mean, that's, you couldn't see what was on the board. It was literally just some 17A stuff. Um, for those of you in what's his name in Rod Marker's class, um, I did post a video kind of explaining a problem very similar to problem three. So if you have questions about problem three, you should go look at that. Um, but also if you look at the graph on Desmos of problem, like you, if you put in Desmos the graph for problem three, it should become pretty clear what is happening there. Um, showing that all those points are a minimum is also not that hard actually. If you, but I would say go watch the video if you want to see that. Um, the, vir the virtual background is from, um, oh God, a friend of mine posted, I think it's, it's from, I can, I can never say his name. Um, the guy who did the movies like Spirited Away and other stuff, which I actually haven't watched, but have enjoyed seeing parts of. Um, it's from one of those movies. I don't actually know that. But they're very available and kind of cool looking. All right, let me change it though. So. A mirror. Where is my mirroring function? Wow. Sorry, my brain. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Okay. And myself. Give you guys the attendance form link. Okay, there we go. Good to go. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Studio. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what should we talk about? What do you guys have questions on? I think for Friday, we finished going over how to classify critical points for Rodriguez. He says that we're going to cover a little bit of double integrals, but that's not covered in the book. Okay. So he did, he did emailed and posted on Pia Piazza about his notes for double integrals that he's going to probably go over on Friday or Monday, I think. Okay. Um, hmm. I, oh. My thought is that I would like to wait and see what he does until I start just jumping into it because there are lots of things to cover with double and girls and I don't imagine he's going to really talk about everything that you would normally talk about like in the 21C class. So I think it would be premature for me to kind of start talking about that. But the, the real, the very, very basics of it. So let me give you one problem or I'll show you one kind of problem and that'll be, yeah, we'll do that and then we'll kind of, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, so let's say, so I'm going to go back to my favorite function. I'm going to make this problem a little bit interesting. So I'm going to try and see if I can draw this all right. Uh, hmm, can we do it there? No. Okay, so here's the idea. I have my favorite function, mad minus x squared minus y squared. And I'm going to find the volume under it over some region in the xy plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph it. Um, sorry, I'm going to draw a circle, right? Yeah, well, sorry. Uh, I'm always kind of thinking, like, how do I want to draw this one? I want to draw it like this. What I actually want to do this, this time around is I want to look at, again, here's my x-axis, my y-axis, here's my z-axis. What I want to do is I want to find um, 
the volume of the surface that is under the surface, the volume that's under the surface and above this triangle in the xy plane. So it's going to kind of look like, oh, I might actually do a good job of drawing this picture. Watch out. Yeah, that's all right. So I've got this kind of, kind of like this triangular prism shape here. Ah, I should have drawn that dashed, oh well. Uh, so can you guys kind of see what's going on there? Make some sense? So the idea is we can use a double integral to find the volume under, uh, like under this surface above this triangle in the, in the xy plane. And so the way we're going to, okay, it's just kind of colors. Kind of, and it's, a, it's very much similar to how we find the area under a curve over some interval. So now we're finding the volume under a surface over some region. So I need to describe that region. And again, I'm just, we'll do this one problem and then we'll leave it back because I don't really know what it means. So here's my xy plane. My region, so I, I didn't, sorry, I forgot to mention. So this is going to be the point x equal to 1. This is the point 1, 1. That's the point 0, 0. So there's a triangular region I want to integrate over. And so the thing is, this triangular region we have to kind of describe, and I like to describe it using vertical strips. Although you can describe it using horizontal strips, it depends. Um, I can probably have made that a little bit bigger. Can you guys see that okay? See some of you are like, whoa! Yeah, okay. Um, so what I'm saying here is that this vertical strip has the top function is y equal to x, the bottom function is y equal to zero. And then it's going to move left and right over the interval from x equals zero to the left to x equals 1 to the right. So when I'm trying to find the volume of this, I'm going to do a double interval over this region of this function with respect to the area of the region. So that's the very general way of writing it. But now we're actually going to write it. So my region, well, the inner limits of integration, so I should say, the outer limits of integration are always constants. Just like for a regular definite integral, the limits of integration are constants, right? Like if you're finding the area under a curve, you're going from some normal real number to some other normal real number. So the outer limits of integration are x equals 0 to x equals 1. And my outer my, the outer integral that we're, so the outer interval is going to be integrated with respect to x. The inner integral is going to be y going from 0 to x. Right? It's not y equals 0 to 1, because if x was 0 to 1 and y was 0 to 1, you'd have a square. We don't have a square, we have a triangle. And then our function, that we're, oh, sorry, and that integral is going to be with respect to dy. I have to make sure I'm thinking. Sorry, I have to double check that I'm actually making sense of this the right way. Yeah, I'm going to keep the y. Yeah, yeah, totally. Sorry, and then we have our function. And here's the thing integrating with respect to one variable is much like differentiating with respect to one variable or taking a partial derivative. You treat the variable of interest like a variable and you just act on it normally. And any other variables get treated like constants. So I'm going to do this inner integral first with respect to y. I'm going to erase this here to give me a little more room. And this is, this is the part that I really wanted to make sure you guys saw. So when you're doing a double integral, you integrate with respect to the inner d whatever first. So we integrate with respect to y. And I'm going to get, so I still have the outer integral here from x equals 0 to x equals 1. But then if I anti-differentiate this, this function with respect to y, 
Well, the antiderivative of a constant, 9, is 9 times y. The antiderivative of a constant, negative x squared, is negative x squared times y. And the antiderivative of the function, negative y squared, is negative y cubed over 3. Oh, and then evaluated from y equals 0 to y equals 1. Sorry, x. Okay, um, for those of you that might have joined us late, here is the attendance form once again. Also, I posted solutions to the quiz on Canvas. I haven't actually finished grading your quizzes yet, but I did pull up post solutions. So you can look at those if you want. I will try to get those graded by the end of today for sure. Um, maybe not for sure, but, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna for sure try. I think we're gonna do it. Um, so plugging in y equals x, we still have x equals zero to x equals one, nine x, minus x squared times x is x cubed, minus x cubed over three. And then minus, you would plug in y equal to zero, but we can see in this case, plugging in zero for y makes everything zero, so I'm not gonna write that down. But if you did plug in y equal zero, you would get zero for all terms. And then it's just a regular integral. So and to differentiate this, you're gonna get nine x squared over two, minus x to the fourth over four, minus x to the fourth over 12. Yeah, I could have put these together, but I didn't feel like doing it. From zero to one, plugging in one, you're gonna get nine halves minus one fourth minus one twelfth. And plugging in zero, you're gonna get zero minus zero minus zero. So we end up getting, let's see, now let's make it all in terms of twelfths. So then six of six, so 54 twelfths, minus three twelfths, minus one twelfth is 50 over 12 or 25 over six. And that's how much volume would be under the curve above this particular triangle. So hopefully when he talks about this on Friday or whenever, it's something similar to this. But definitely, even if you're not talking about the physical interpretation being like volume under a surface and above the xy plane, you will still have to be doing this thing where first you have to differentiate with respect to one variable and you treat the other one as a constant. And then after, and then you plug in the limits of integration that sometimes have the other variable in them. And then after you do that, then you anti differentiate again and you plug in your regular limits of integration. That's kind of how that works. Um, other questions? I'm a little uneasy on the chain rule. Could we do one, one example of that? Yeah, and I was looking at his homework problem. His, his homework problem is a little bit different because it's a vector value. Sorry, I'm looking at Rademacher's homework problem number one, where, so I'll, I'll I'm, gonna, I'm gonna modify it just because I, I feel like I shouldn't actually do the actual homework problems, but I can do very, very slightly different ones if I feel like, yeah, I feel like that's fine. So let's say that, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend like I didn't give myself the original function. Um, I don't think, yeah, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, one sec. Yeah, I'll, it's, I'll tell you this. I have I have my marker somewhere. I definitely got it from someone. I don't know. I don't remember at the moment who it was, but that's all right. So, sorry. So we have this. We're given that del f del x of x comma y is equal to. And, and I said I was going to make up something new. Let's sure. Let's go with. That doesn't sound too terrible. Let's go with sine of x, y. Now, I'm pretending like this is my function that I came from. So del f, del x of x, well, ow. Sorry, the problem, no, that's should be fine, okay. That is gonna be uh, cosine of x, y times y, del f, del y is gonna be cosine of x, y times x. Right, I'm taking the derivative of sine some stuff, and also I'm going to derivative the stuff. 
So the derivative of sine of x, y is cosine of x, y times the derivative of x, y, which is one times y. And same thing here. And then we've got, and this is funky. So then we're saying we've got g going from r to r2, meaning g is going to take some input and spit out two different things, where g of t is equal to, I'm going to change it up, I'm going to make it e to the t. And so, yeah, see, here's the, the, uh, this notation I find probably. G of t is e to the t comma t squared plus one. And I think when I read this question the first time, I didn't realize that was a vector. I really don't love this notation for vectors. So I'm going to rewrite it as this, because this reminds me, oh, I'm working with a vector, not with a, well, no, I, I want to call it a vector. I mean, it's fine to write it as a coordinate. It's just the, and then we're being asked to figure out what dh dt is. So we're being asked to find the derivative of h of t, where h of t is just f of g of t. OK, so we're being asked to use the chain layer, right? And here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that f is a function of x and y. And then x and y are both functions of t. Um, yeah, OK. But OK, OK. So here, here's, the, here's the problem. I'm, it's not really a problem. It's, it's that I don't have enough space is the real problem. <laughs> um, so here's the thing, right? I'm trying to find my derivative. So that's going to be, so df dt is going to be del f del x, del x del t. Plus del f del y, del y. And I feel like I missed something. No, I didn't. Yeah. OK. Hmm, sorry. F, God, this is so. Uh, so we've got F of G of T. Sorry, I think I might be interpreting this one a little bit incorrectly. I'm, I apologize. I'm getting a little bit confused, to be honest. Um, yeah. I can see why you guys had questions about this one. It's a little bit confusing. Um, let me see here. So he's so. So f of t, where, okay, so here's how I'm seeing this, I think. I feel like this is supposed to be acting like our x, and this is like our y, because, right, f of, f of first thing comma, sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. I think we're still right though. So here's the thing, right? Because they didn't give you the original function. Sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize and like figuring this out as we go along here. But okay, oh well, that's not like this thing. So my our original function was sine of x, y. And but we're pretending like we didn't know that. So if we did though, we can say, oh, f of g of t is f of first thing, second thing. That's I can make my x, that's I can make my y. And then so we can write f of g of t as e to the t times cosine of, sorry, back it up. This is my f of x, y. 
it's going to be sine of e to the t times t squared plus 1. Okay. And so if we differentiate that, so we're going to do this both ways, is what I decided. So differentiating this, sorry, so this is my f of g of t. And the derivative. Well, the derivative of this is cosine of all of this garbage times the derivative of the inside, which you have to use the product rule for, which will be e to the t times t squared plus 1 plus the not derivative of e to the t, which is still e to the t times 2t. Okay. Yeah, that's the way we're kind of not supposed to do this problem, I think. Because right, we're supposed to not know what the original function was, even though it's obviously something you were able to derive, right? You guys clearly figured out that the original function was e to the xy, which is great. But I think the point of this is to be like, we don't actually need this. Because I think it's still true. <sighs> Sorry, I'm, I'm out of room. I'm going to have to go to the other side. So we'll come back and compare them. So I'm pretty sure it's still true that we can use this. Um, well, let's find out. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's going to work. Okay, so let me go to the other side. Ah. So here we're going to here we're going to do kind of at the limit information, right? So we're going to say, okay, we know that. Del f del x is y cosine of x y. We know that del f del y is x cosine of x y, and we know that g of t. It might it might make sense to write it in parentheses in this case. But then I'm going to go with this that for h of t equal to f of g of t, and dh dt is equal to, while we're doing right the, the chain thing, right? f is a function of g. Okay, but, oh God, this is where I, sorry, this is where I get kind of thrown. I'm just gonna write f is a function of x and y, x and y are both functions of g. That's the way I'm relating things. I feel like I'm missing a tiny thing here. I'm not gonna sweat it. I guess what we're saying is x is equal to the e to the t part and y is equal to the t squared plus 1 part. So we're still doing this. So del f del x, well, there it is. It's y times cosine of xy dx dt, so this, yeah, so this part, you do have to recognize that this is your xy. So in the homework problem, his xy is sine t cosine of t. I'm sorry. So then dx dt, well, the derivative of x of t equals to e to the t is just e to the t. Plus, then we have del f del i, which is right there. Um, times dy dt. dy dt is just 2t. And yeah, that's totally the same. Because, right, look, this is the y times the x prime. So it's the, it's the derivative of this times the not derivative of that. And then you have it flipped around. You have the x, so the not derivative of this, times the y prime. So this, you have, okay, okay. So you have y, x prime, you have x, y prime. Which, if you look back at the other side, was exactly the product rule that we did right here. So I'm going to fill in the blanks, but that's actually, so yes, it's correct. And so, so what they want us to do, oh, that's annoying. Go away. How do I turn that off? That's oh, you know what it is? It's, it's one of those like news notifications on my phone and my phone like and my computer talk to each other. 
that's terrible. I'm not trying to, I have to like put my phone on. Do not disturb while I'm in class. Sorry, one second. Can I work my phone? Maybe. Holy smokes, maybe not. Okay, there we go. Good. So, plugging what y is, we get t squared plus one. I'm going to put this over here times e to the t times cosine of xy, which is e to the t times t squared plus one. Um, plus x, which is e to the t times 2t times cosine of the same, which is exactly this, right? It's cosine of e to the t times t squared plus 1 times the sum of t squared plus 1 e to the t times e to the t times t squared plus e to the t. So yes, long, long story, very much shorter. You can totally do this the way you think you should do it, which is using the chain rule and writing f as a function of x and y, and then x and y are being replaced with the x coordinate of the g function and the y coordinate of the g function. So in this problem, your, you know, your x of t, y of t is equal to that sine of t comma cosine of t. So that's what his x and y are. So in his, in his problem, it should be the del f del x, which is given, times the dx dt, which is going to be cosine of t, because the derivative sine is cosine, plus del f del y, which is also given, times dy dt, which is going to be the derivative of cosine of t, which is the negative sine of t. And then it'll be the sum of those two things added together. Um, one thing I noticed, I graded, I think I graded like problem one of most of your quizzes. A few of you did um, for some of the for some of the directional derivatives, some of you gave answers that were vectors. And I just want to remind you that when you're finding a directional derivative, your answer should always just be a number because you're just trying to find like the slope. And the slope isn't a derivative, the slope is just a value. So, and I think it's because a lot of, some of you missed um, doing the dot product, uh, right? When you do the dot product of two vectors, you multiply the components together, but then you have to add the components. I think a lot of you multiply them together and then just left it as first thing, second thing, but that's not it. So, just wanted to mention that because I saw that from a few of you. Okay, good, yeah. So this summer problem is weird. I feel like Rodemacher is doing a lot of this vector value stuff, which seems strange to me. I imagine there's a point that it's gonna to get to, or like we're gonna use it for something in the future, but I don't know what that is yet. Well, that's, uh, no, there's a point. It's, it's not that weird, I take it back. It's totally sensible. Um, other questions? If you guys don't have questions, that's fine. I've got stuff I can talk about. I can find it. Well, feel free to jump in if you have a question, but I'm going to continue with the example we were doing at the end of last class, which was the solving the system of linear differential equations. Because I know you guys, I don't think anyone's talked about it just yet, but it's definitely where you're going. So, that's kind of dark. Okay. And just as a reminder to myself, so Ron and Mockers class, you guys have a midterm on Friday, right? Okay. Yes. And Rodriguez's class, you guys don't have any midterms, right? <laughs> We have no midterms. But you guys have quizzes or something? We don't have quizzes. It's okay. just the finals. Awesome. Great. Um, and then the other guy who I don't even remember his name because he doesn't talk to me. Um, Carlson, do you have a test? It's okay if you guys don't know. Um, all right, so where were we last time? We were, so I'll give you a brief reminder. We were trying to solve this system of linear equations, which was the following. It was dx1, d2, 
dt equal to x1 plus 3x2. Sometimes we'll use x and y, sometimes we'll use x1 and x2. So dx2 dt equal to 2x1 two plus 2x2. Two and these are the same exact example we were doing last time. And what we did was we had found, um, so we would rewritten this as this vector, dx1 dt, dx2 dt equal to 1, 3, 2, 2 times x1, x2. And then we started finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the matrix. And to find the eigenvalues, we did the following. We did the determinant of the matrix. Sorry, we did the determinant of the matrix minus lambda times the identity matrix, which is the determinant of, so really if you want to write it out, it's the determinant of this, R matrix minus lambda times the identity matrix. All that really amounts to is changing our matrix by doing minus lambda on each of the diagonal entries. So this ends up being the determinant <clears throat> of one minus lambda, three, two, two minus lambda. And then the determinant of a matrix, sorry, the determinant of a two by two matrix is always just the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off diagonals. So we had one minus lambda times two minus lambda minus three times two. That was gonna be two minus two lambda minus lambda minus three lambda plus lambda squared minus six. So we end up with lambda squared minus three lambda minus four. And we set that equal to zero. And our solutions are lambda equal to, I guess I can factor. <laughs> we get lambda minus four times lambda plus one equal to zero. So we have lambda equal to four, lambda equal to negative one. Okay, so then after you find the eigenvalues, then we found the eigenvectors. And I think we had almost finished that, but let's just run through it real quick. So the way I like to find the eigenvectors, I guess actually let me back up one mental step here. So just as a reminder, for an eigenvalue lambda, the associated eigenvector is a solution to the equation the matrix times the eigenvector v, which I'm going to call v, sorry, is equal to lambda times the eigenvector v. So whenever you think about what an eigenvector is, it's a vector that the matrix multiplied by it just scales it. And that's not always true, right? When you multiply like this matrix, minus that matrix, yeah. When you multiply this matrix by some random vector, like, I don't know, 4, 5, you're not going to get a multiple of 4, 5, unless I pick badly. You're going to get 4 plus 15 is 19, 8 plus 10 is 18, and 19, 18 is definitely not a multiple of 4, 5. Whereas eigenvectors are special. When you multiply the matrix by the eigenvector, you do get a multiple of the eigenvector. And the way we solve for that, or at least the way I like to solve for it, is by taking my matrix. which was one, three, two, two, multiplying by my eigenvector. So I'm going to call this eigenvector V1. And it's going to equal lambda, which I'm going to do lambda equal to negative one. So there's lambda one equal to negative one, and there's my eigenvector V1 again. Right? Right. And then I'm just going to write either equation. So you can either look at the top equation, say 1 times x plus 3 times y equals negative x. And then we have 3y equal to negative 2x. And at this point, I just like to pick x equal to the coefficient of y and y equal to the coefficient of x. 
So I'm going to say x equals 3, which means y has to be negative 2. You could also solve, right? You could say x equals negative 3 halves y, and then pick y equal to negative 2 and get x equal to 3. So my eigenvector here is 3, negative 2. So this matrix times that vector is equal to negative 1 times that vector. Now I should point out, you don't have to use the first equation, you can use the second equation, but you only really need to use one. If I use the second equation, I get 2x plus 2y equal to negative 1 times y. But look, I've got the same exact equation. I've got 2x equals negative 3y. I'm going to get the same vector. And then I should point out, this is not the only choice. There's actually an infinite number of choices for an eigenvector. You can pick any multiple of that. So we could have picked some other eigenvector, v1 star, could be 15, negative 10. That would also be an eigenvector for this eigenvalue, for this matrix. We usually try to pick the eigenvector that has the smallest possible integer values. I would not pick y equal to 1 and x equal to negative 3 halves. I would not pick y equal to negative 10 and x equal to 15. I would pick this one or the negative of it. But again, any choice is technically valid. And then we can find the other eigenvector as well. I know we already found it, so I'll just remind you last of it. Find the other eigenvector. It's the same equation. And now this is the eigenvector v2. And well, it's almost the same equation, except now the eigenvalue is 4 instead of negative 1. So then writing out the equation, I get 1 times x plus 3 times y equals 4 times x. Subtracting x, you get 3y equal to 3x, you get y equal to x. And typically the choice there is 1 and 1. Great, so we have our eigenvalues and our eigenvectors. So what are we gonna do with them? Well, we're gonna write the solution to the equation. So we're trying to solve the equation. The derivative of this vector is equal to, right? Because I could say that this is the derivative of x1 and x2 in each spot, which is why I think we're talking about vector value functions, because right? we're kind of just treating these separately, but still doing stuff to them at the same time. So the derivative of this is equal to this matrix times that vector. And here is the solution. The solution is that the vector x is equal to c1e to the lambda 1t times the first eigenvector plus c2e to the lambda 2t times the second eigenvector. Very much like how the solution to the regular differential equation dy dt is y equals ce to the kt. Sorry. Right, if you're solving d, let's say dx dt equal to k times x, the solution is x of t equal to ce to the kt. Here we've definitely seen that before. Same idea, it's just a little bit more complicated. All right, so here we're actually going to write it all out. So x, which is x1, x2, is equal to c1, which you don't know what that is yet, e to the lambda 1, lambda 1, I forget which one we picked, lambda 1. Lambda 1 was negative 1. And our eigenvector was 3, negative 2. Yep, 3, negative 2. Plus c2, e to the lambda 2. 
times t times v2, which is 1, 1. OK, so let me give you guys a little bit more. So this, this is a solution, a general solution, because right? we haven't solved for c1 and c2 yet, because we don't have any initial conditions for this problem, to this equation. So what I'm really saying is my solution is both at the same time, x1 equal to c1 e to the negative t times 3 plus c2 e to the 4t times 1. And x2 is equal to c1 e to the negative t times negative 2 plus c2 e to the 4t times 1. And we can check this. Normally, I probably wouldn't. No, I think I would. Once. Let's see. Why? You have one another news notification. Stupid. I'm, I'm annoyed with my, my phone. I'm going to try to figure out. Can you guys hear it when it beeps like that? Dings. Yeah, okay. Yeah, playing. <sighs> All right. So we're actually going to check this out here. And I think, yeah, I'm going to erase a little bit. So I'm really just going to throw this and this in here. Well, I mean, you could do it. You could do it either way, right? Um, no, I have to. I can't do both. So dx one dt. So I'm going to take the derivative of this and look what I get. So dx one dt is equal to the derivative of three c one e to the negative t is three c one e to the negative t times negative one. The derivative of c two e to the four t is c2 e to the 4t times 4. And I will tell you this is exactly 1 of x1 plus 3 of x2, which seems kind of crazy, but let's check it out. If I do 1 of x1 plus 3 of x2, that's going to be, I'm probably going to run over here, one of these. So 3c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the 4t plus three of these. Um, I'm going to write it, sorry. 3 times c1 e to the negative t times negative 2. Looks like that is negative 2 c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the 4t. And yeah, we're gonna be fine here. And if we look at this, let's see. I have three C one e to the negative t, and uh, three times negative is negative six C one e to the negative t. And three minus six is negative three C one e to the negative t. And then C two e to the four t plus three times C two is one plus three is four C two e to the four t. And look. This and this are exactly the same. So we see that, oh yeah, this solution here is the solution, right? If you take the derivative of x1, you exactly get x1 plus 3x2. And we're not going to do it, but it is also true. If you take the derivative of x2, you will totally get 2x1 plus 2x2. So this is how we solve the system of linear equations, of linear, sorry, the system of, this linear, oh my God, system of linear differential equations. Um, sorry, where'd you go? And then, yeah, might as well. So let me actually write this on the other, uh, I don't want to erase, I do. So let's, so yeah, so I'm gonna erase all this. Did all that. So one more time, I actually I'm gonna I'm gonna write so generally the solution x or x of t if you like, which is just x1 of t, x2 of t. Wow. Killing me, phone, you're killing me. Um is 
c1 e to the lambda 1 t times the vector v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t times the vector v2, where v1 and v2 are the eigenvectors. Now, we can also say there are some initial conditions. Let's say that we have the initial conditions that x1 at 0 was equal to, what do I got here? 2 and x2 of 0 was equal to negative 1. So in the past, when it was just like a, what, a regular differential equation, y equals c to the kt stuff, c was just your initial value, right? You would plug in 0 for t, and you would get c equal to whatever the y value was. It's not so easy here. It's not going to end up being that c1 is 2 and c2 is negative 1. But it's not super hard to solve. All we're going to do is we're going to plug in, all right, we're going to plug in 2 here, negative 1 here. I'm sorry. So, all right, so I, so yes. All right, there's lots of stuff happening here. This is the, right, there's my general solution to my differential, to my system of differential equations. And now I'm going to plug in 0 for t and 2 for x1 and negative 1 for x2. Wow, what is going on? Why is my, hmm. Mm, I'm going to have to change these notifications. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm so annoyed by it. It's really the truth. So playing in 2 for x1 and negative 1 for x2. And then playing in 0 for t, I get c1 times e to the 0 is 1. And then c2 times e to the 0 is 1. And then we can just solve for c1 and c2. So... Now I just wrote this down, but I don't want to erase it. So I end up getting, let's see, so I have two equations. 2 equals 3 times c1 plus 1 times c2. And negative 1 equals negative 2 c1 plus c2. And then you can solve this in any way you like. I'm going to subtract them. 2 minus negative 1 is 3. 3 minus negative 2 is 5. C2 minus C2 is 0. So C1 equals 3 fifths. And then solving for C2 here, C2 equals 2 minus 3 times C1. So C2 equals 10 fifths minus 9 fifths, which is 1 fifth. So we can solve for C1 and C2. C1 is 3 fifths. C2 is 1 fifth. So big picture. This is the um, this is how we solve a linear system of differential equations. Specifically, a linear system of two differential equations in two variables. It is possible to do more, but then you need bigger matrices, which are hard to define the eigenvalues for and harder to find the um, the determinant and all that stuff. So usually we are limited to two by two matrices in this class. Um, James? Yeah. I was wondering how you got 3 equals 5 times C1. Did you, you add it or subtract the two equations? So I just did this minus this. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you, but you also, alternatively, right, you could have said C2 equals 2 minus 3 C1, mm. and then plug this in for C2 there and solve for C1. It's just like, you know, substitution or elimination method for solving a system of two equations and two variables. So I think that's about all I've got. Again, if you have questions about uh, homework problem number three from Rademacher, go watch the video. I think I did a pretty decent job of explaining it. Also, if you look at, if you, because the hard part for that question is that you can look at the graph and you can totally see you have one maximum and then an infinite number of minimums. Showing the infinite number of minimums are minimums is challenging, but not. Here's the thing that you're gonna see if you watch the video. If you find D, the determinant of the Hessian for those minimums, you should go look at how to do it because it is kind of interesting, but you end up getting the D equals zero, which is inconclusive. So then you have to be like, oh, I've got something, sorry. I've got some function, and I think I made mine like x squared minus y squared minus nine squared. Well, this is always greater than or equal to zero. 
right? No matter what you're doing, that's true. So it's going to be a minimum when it's equal to zero. And this is equal to zero when the insides are zero. But that's exactly the circle. Sorry, that's a plus, not a minus. Apologies, that's supposed to be a plus there. That's exactly the circle, x squared plus y squared equal to 9. So you exactly get this function equal to 0, which is the smallest it can be, on exactly the points that are on the circle of radius 3. And that should be enough of a justification for why those points are all minimums. OK. That's all I got for you guys. Um, I'll see you on Friday. Yeah. Let me know if you have questions in the discussion or on, on the email. I'll talk to you guys later. Oh, and fill out the attendance. Here's the attendance one more time, just in case you didn't get it. James, did you receive my email about Rodriguez's homework? I don't know if I did. I definitely received it from someone, but I don't know if I got it from you, Teresa. Okay. When did you send it? I think I sent it, I don't, was it was around earlier this week or last, or towards the end oh, of the week. Oh, you're talking about the previous homework, like homework two? I think it was homework three or two. I don't remember. I definitely got homework two from you. I don't know if I got homework three from you, so. Oh, okay. Whoops. It's okay. I got it from someone else. It's no big deal. Okay. All right. Take care. I'm going to end the meeting. I'll see you guys later. Thank you. You're welcome.